Most people who attain greatness do so in a particular field or because of one superb skill or achievement. But the man who is the subject of this session was a remarkable exception. He achieved greatness in so many fields and endeavors that no one label, artist, inventor, scientist, engineer, can do him justice. The man is Leonardo da Vinci, and he was the foremost genius of a period of time when genius was almost commonplace, the Italian Renaissance. Leonardo's great fame has as much to do with his versatility as with his expertise. He was a musician, a painter, a sculptor, an engineer, an architect, a botanist, a zoologist, an anatomist, a graphic artist, and an architect, just to name some of his vocations. As a painter, he is best known for two masterpieces that are among the most recognizable paintings in the world, The Last Supper and The Mona Lisa. But most of all, he is known for his mind, a curious, even insatiable mind, that explored almost every realm of life and contributed to almost every category of human knowledge. There is no other individual who so fully personifies the idea of the Renaissance man, a term used today to refer to a man of varied interests and talents, a term that has its roots in the lives of Leonardo and his contemporaries. To understand the life and work of Leonardo, it's first necessary to understand the times in which he lived, the Renaissance itself. Renaissance is a French word that means rebirth, but it does not describe a period of French culture. It describes a culture that existed primarily in Italy. This period covers roughly the 1400s and 1500s. It is considered a rebirth because historians of the 1800s, when looking back in time, realized that human learning seemed to come to somewhat of a standstill after the fall of the Roman Empire. This standstill persisted through the Dark Ages. After the Dark Ages, around 1200, learning began to take an upswing and it reached its peak in Italy two and three hundred years later. By the 1400s, the human mind was once again at a pinnacle of brilliance and creativity. This brilliance was most strongly reflected in art, and the three artists who most exemplified it are Michelangelo, Raphael, and Leonardo da Vinci, the Renaissance Trinity. During the Renaissance, artists rediscovered another previous golden age in human development the classical cultures of ancient Greece and Rome. They copied the style of the art of these times in their search for the perfection of form and in their fidelity to nature. But the Renaissance had its own separate characteristics, too. Most of the art from Greece and Rome had pagan themes. But Renaissance art took its subjects from religion, devotional images of the Madonna and Child, of Adam and Eve, of various saints, and of scenes from the Bible. Also new in the Renaissance was the idea of patrons. Before this time, it was usually the church that financed and supported artists. During the Renaissance, individuals, usually from the nobility, helped support artists and scholars and paid for many of their important works. This encouraged the rise of the individual artist and created an atmosphere in which artists could reach their full potential. In a certain way, it freed them, because patrons were often more flexible about how the artists spent their time than the church had been. Artists of the Renaissance tried to depict people and scenes realistically, accurately. They created three-dimensional forms on two-dimensional surfaces by using mathematics and geometry. This was a departure from previous art, which had been more decorative and flat. There were two principal forms of art during the Renaissance, the fresco and the panel. Frescoes were large and were usually painted on walls. Panel painting was one of the great innovations of the Renaissance. The paintings were on thin wooden panels that made them portable. Leonardo himself designed many styles of panels. The three Italian cities that were the centers of the Renaissance were Florence, Venice, and Rome. These cities were not part of the one country of Italy as we know them today. They were instead city-states with their own governments. They often competed against each other and sometimes even went to war. The Renaissance was a lively, dynamic time, not just in the field of art. Changes were occurring in all areas of human life. This era included the rise of the cities and the end of feudalism, world exploration and discovery, the invention of gunpowder, the invention of the printing press, the beginning of free thinking, and the beginning of modern science. It was the time of Christopher Columbus, Magellan, Joan of Arc, Martin Luther, and Copernicus. It was also the time of the Medicis, the ruling family in Florence that took such an active role in supporting the artists of that city. It was the time of the Borgias, 
the powerful Italian family known for its ambition and treachery. And it was the time of Niccolo Machiavelli, the Italian statesman who gained fame with his cynical view of government and politics in the book The Prince. The prince in his book was Caesar Borgia himself. Into this swirling, expansive arena of human growth was born Leonardo da Vinci on April 15, 1452. He was born twenty miles outside of Florence in the little town of Vinci, the illegitimate child of a country girl and a public official. He was raised by his father's parents on a small family estate. As a child, Leonardo was handsome, wiry, and strong, with a kind and generous nature. His thirst for knowledge was evident even at the earliest age. He liked to collect and study small creatures like lizards and butterflies, but his respect for animals was so great that he refused to eat any meat. He would buy songbirds at the marketplace so he could take them home and release them from their cages. Leonardo particularly loved horses. He studied them, and when he was older, he became an excellent rider and trainer. Later, when he was an established artist, some of his most notable sketches were of the anatomy of horses, and at least twice he attempted large sculptures of them. As a youth, Leonardo was also fascinated with birds in flight, and he dreamed of inventing a machine so people could fly. There would be sketches of these dreams later. He was always good at drawing, and could write and draw with either his left or right hand, but he always preferred his left. He once said, I have even seen shapes in clouds and on patchy walls, which have roused me to beautiful inventions. And even though such shapes totally lacked finish in any single part, they were not devoid of perfection in their gestures or other movements. When he was sixteen, Leonardo's grandfather died, and he went to live with his father in Florence. It was a propitious move. His father, noting his son's artistic talents, sent him to study with a respected artist named Andrea del Verrocchio. From this moment on, da Vinci's course had been set. Verrocchio took Leonardo to his studio as an apprentice, and then invited him to live with him as well. Leonardo accepted. For the next several years under Verrocchio's tutelage, the talents of Leonardo da Vinci began to emerge and blossom. He practiced drawing from nature, learned painting, modeling with clay, and casting in bronze. Verrocchio was also an engineer. With his influence, Leonardo learned geometry and made navigation instruments. Because this was an age of exploration, navigational equipment was in great demand. Da Vinci was one of a group of apprentices who worked with Verrocchio. They often had lively parties and entertained themselves with music and singing. Leonardo had an excellent voice and would accompany his songs on the lyre. It is said he also liked to play practical jokes and tricks on his friends, but that he was even-tempered and even somewhat reserved. He could be gregarious and he could be reclusive. This was true of the artist throughout his life. In 1472, when he was twenty, Leonardo became a master of his trade and Verrocchio's chief assistant. But it may be that it was Leonardo who caused his master to give up painting forever. Legend has it that Leonardo added an angel to one of Verrocchio's paintings, and that when Verrocchio saw it, he knew immediately that the young man's skills were superior to his own. He vowed never to paint again, and devoted himself from then on to sculpture. The story has a happy ending, however. Verrocchio became one of the greatest sculptors in Italy. Meanwhile, Leonardo continued to perfect his own skills. His trademark style was already in evidence. The delicacy, the curved lines, the green and gray tones. He made dozens of sketches for each of his paintings and concentrated on every detail. He studied botany so he could paint plants and flowers accurately. He used the actual wings of birds as models when he wanted to paint the wings of an angel. He used mathematics to create a formula for the perfect proportions of an ideal human body. He painted portraits that admirers said seemed less like portraits and more like the people themselves. In 1478, at the age of 26, Leonardo was working independently and received his first important commission. He was to paint an altarpiece for a chapel in the city hall. But before he could even start work, the commission was transferred to someone else. It was the beginning of a pattern in da Vinci's life. Many of his projects were never completed. They were abandoned at preliminary stages or were cancelled by either the artist himself or by others. The completed works of da Vinci number in the very few but they are sufficient for all the world to have recognized his genius. Four years after the abandoned altar project, Leonardo set out for Milan in northern Italy. At the time, 
Milan was under the control of the Duke, Ludovico Sforza, a patron of the arts with a particular interest in beautifying his city. Milan was an important center for the manufacture of arms, and it was a fortified city, enclosed by high walls, surrounded by towers and a moat. At the time, wars were breaking out all over Italy, and Milan was in danger of assault by Venice and other cities. Leonardo offered his services as an architect and a military engineer. He arrived in Milan for what would be a 17-year visit, a visit during which his genius would unfold in all its versatility and power. During his stay in Milan, Leonardo also continued to paint. His most famous creation of that period is called Madonna of the Rocks, which is known for its fragile, natural-looking figures of the Virgin and her son. About this time, an epidemic of the plague swept through Milan, killing thousands of people. Leonardo refused to leave. He continued to work, painting portraits, helping with city replanning, and becoming chief engineer to Ludovico Sforza. When there was a total eclipse of the sun, he designed a device to study it without damage to the eyes. He also designed sets and costumes for lavish parties and events at the court, including the creation of a revolving stage. Leonardo was well-loved at the court in Milan. He impressed people with his elegant dress, his singing, and, of course, his artistry. He also became a teacher during this period, and one of his students, a boy named Salai, became his personal servant and stayed with da Vinci for 25 years. It was in these early Milan years that Leonardo became deeply interested in non-artistic subjects. He took up mechanics, anatomy, biology, math, and physics. And still he had time for his art. In Milan, Leonardo began work on an enormous bronze statue of a horseman that was to be a memorial to Ludovico's father. He poured immense amounts of research and time into the project, studying and drawing prize stallions, making wax and clay models and inventing a special method for casting the immense sculpture. But once again, it was a project that was never completed. When threats of war rose again, Ludovico used all of the bronze to be made into cannons instead. Then in 1495, when Leonardo was 43, Ludovico commissioned him for a mural to be hung in a nearby monastery. This project would be completed, and this project would make history. It was called The Last Supper. After the Last Supper, da Vinci continued on in Milan, drawing in his elaborate sketchbooks, making designs for Ludovico's castle, working with mathematicians, studying science, and, of course, painting. He took a particular interest in geology, in mechanics, and in hydraulics. Da Vinci never viewed science as something separate and unrelated to his art. To Leonardo and to other Renaissance artists, each discipline enhanced the other. Leonardo hoped to use his scientific studies for greater understanding of structure and form. This understanding, he hoped, would then be reflected in his art. Likewise, he used art to enhance his understanding of science. His tireless sketches were in part an exercise in understanding anatomy, structure, and movement. Each discipline helped him increase his skills in the other. During this period, Leonardo began to be known for his own unique painting style the strong contrasts of light and shade, so different from the clear, distinct lines of previous paintings. Da Vinci seemed content in Milan and very productive, but soon the unpredictable politics of Renaissance Italy would alter his life and steer him in new directions. In 1499, the French armies invaded, took Lodovico prisoner, and sent him to France under guard. They also hanged Leonardo's best friend, the architect Andrea de Ferrara and they destroyed Leonardo's gigantic model of the bronze horse that was never completed, a model that was popular with the Milanese public and with da Vinci himself. Through all this turmoil, da Vinci carried on with fortitude. He studied geometry and anatomy and tried to invent a flying machine. He practiced his music. He continued to sketch. But Milan was no longer the same, and after a while, da Vinci knew he had to leave. He traveled to Mantua and to Urbino, where he served as chief military engineer to the notorious Cesare Borgia. It was unclear why the sensitive and creative da Vinci would have established a relationship with the unscrupulous and destructive Borgia. Some believe he was drawn to the excitement of the Borgia court. Others feel he was intrigued by Borgia himself and found him an interesting study. Whatever the reason, he stayed in Urbino for some time, 
working on, among other things, map-making. His maps of this period laid the groundwork for modern cartography. He also drew plans to build canals to divert the Arno River, plans that showed a sophisticated knowledge of hydraulics and engineering. Although these plans were never carried out, centuries later the highway from Florence to the sea was built over the exact route Leonardo chose for a canal. It was in Urbino that da Vinci met the brilliant writer-statesman Niccolo Machiavelli. But the tyranny and cruelty of the Borgia's family outweighed any of the benefits of Urbino, and when Cesare Borgia had one of Leonardo's friends strangled, it was the last straw. Da Vinci returned to Florence. In Florence, da Vinci received a hero's welcome. The city was delighted to have its famous artist back, and deluged him with invitations and offers of work. Everybody seemed to want to have their portrait painted by Leonardo, the obscure as well as the prominent. He refused them all except one. She was a shy woman, the 24-year-old wife of a Florentine merchant named Giocondo. Stories say that while she posed, Leonardo called in jesters and musicians to entertain her. He thought she looked morose and hoped to cheer her up a bit. His attempts to amuse his subject did evoke at least one smile that we know of. When he completed the portrait, he called it Mona Lisa. During this period in Florence, Leonardo created many other works, too, and together they would inspire the next generation of artists, including Andrea del Sarto, Michelangelo, and Raphael. During his Mona Lisa period, da Vinci also made numerous anatomical drawings in order to further understand the muscles, joints, and workings of the human body. To help in his studies, he dissected corpses, chiefly those of criminals. He once stated that he had dissected over 30 corpses in his lifetime, in his pursuit to understand the inner functions of the body. His drawings were so advanced they were used in medical schools. They are considered the first accurate portrayals of human anatomy in history. While working on the Mona Lisa, da Vinci also began work on a great mural of a battle scene. To prepare, he made full-scale drawings of men and horses in violent motion, drawings that were stunning and drew crowds of admirers. This mural, besides its artistic value, led to a great moment in art history when the two reigning masters of the Renaissance worked side by side. The government had asked da Vinci to make a mural for a wall in the town hall, and it had asked Michelangelo, da Vinci's arch-rival, to paint a mural on a different wall in the same room. For some time the two worked side by side, the younger Michelangelo learning something of the ways of the older master. But before the work could progress very far, Leonardo abandoned the project. There were two reasons. One was that he was experimenting with a new technique that didn't work, and the mural began to crumble almost immediately. And two was that he was called away to Milan. The mural became yet another unfinished work of art, and we know it only by the exquisite sketches he left behind, which changed forever the way artists would render battle scenes. This mural that never was is known by the title The Battle of Angiari. In Milan, King Louis XII had arrived, and he promptly appointed da Vinci royal painter and engineer. During these years, Leonardo made designs for the king's palace and traveled to the mountains where he would continue his study of nature. He became fascinated with water, how it flowed, melted, condensed, all its various forms and movements. He studied its dynamics and, of course, made drawings in his sketchbooks. He also continued to study anatomy, with a special interest this time in the heart, arteries, and lungs. Leonardo's sketchbooks are a phenomenon unto themselves. In almost all of them, his notes were written in an eccentric right-to-left style that could be read when held up to a mirror. No one is sure why he did this, since the code was far too simple to guarantee secrecy. Furthermore, he clearly stated that he hoped his notebooks would be published someday. Nevertheless, he seemed to prefer that the information in them not be communicated easily and quickly. The notebooks, many of which were not discovered until 1965, explore every possible field of science. He was, in a sense, the first scientific illustrator and an early graphic artist. His plan was to observe all forms of the visible world and to describe those forms and structures as accurately as possible. Intricate drawings are supported by descriptive text as he tries to analyze how and why things function. His art sketches, too, contained detailed notes. He seemed to feel compelled to record every one of his perceptions and to document his creative process. His notebooks are unique in the history of art. 
In the year 1513, at the age of 63, Leonardo moved to Rome at the invitation of one of the Medicis. He was given his own apartment in the Vatican and a corps of servants and students. But even these luxuries could not make him happy in Rome. The pace of life was too busy, too active for the contemplative Leonardo. He withdrew and began working on science experiments, this time with a focus on optics. His experiments also became somewhat bizarre during this period. He transformed a live lizard into a dragon by adding wings, a horn, and big eyes, and he used the creature to scare away unwanted visitors. The Pope became annoyed with da Vinci because he left so many projects unfinished, and there was gossip about him at court and among the servants. To make matters worse, Leonardo began having troubling visions about the destruction of the world, many of which he recorded in his sketchbooks. In 1516, unhappy and growing more and more reclusive, Leonardo returned to Milan. But he didn't stay long. Within a year came an invitation from King Francis to come to France and serve as the king's painter, engineer, and architect. Da Vinci left Italy, never to return again. The king set Leonardo up in a castle at Clou, which had an underground tunnel connecting it to the palace. Leonardo met with the king every day for discussions, collected a handsome salary, and worked on plans for a model city and a canal system. By now, Leonardo had grown old, and he was in ill health. His right side was partially paralyzed. He began to confront the idea of his mortality, and never a religious man before, he joined the Catholic Church. With the help of friends, he rose from bed to receive the last rites. In April of 1519, he made out a will and designed his own funeral, even specifying the number of candles. He died a month later on May 2nd at the age of 67 at Clou, France, and was buried quietly in a church nearby. The church was damaged during the French Revolution, and what was left was torn down at the beginning of the 19th century. Today, the grave of Leonardo da Vinci can no longer be found. Leonardo left behind a wealth of sketches and drawings but his actual surviving paintings number only 17. There are others that cannot be conclusively attributed to him. Yet in one form or another, we have a record of most of his major works. One of the first of these was painted in 1474, when da Vinci was only 22 years old. It is a portrait entitled Ginevra de Benci, and it is in this painting that his unique style is first evident. The painting is basically traditional, but it has touches that could only be da Vinci. One is the detail, particularly in the intricate curling hair of Ginevra. Another is the use of shadowing, particularly on the model's face. This shadowing technique is called chiroscuro. The painting is also considered by art historians to be the first psychological portrait ever painted. The model in it, who reminds one very much of the Mona Lisa, who followed thirty years later, projects a strong mood, a mood of introspection and even melancholy. This painting is the only work of da Vinci in an American museum. It is housed at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. A few years after the Shadow of Ginevra, Leonardo worked on a picture that's considered to be his most important early painting. He worked on it, but as was common, he didn't finish it. The painting is called Adoration of the Magi, and it's admired because of the way the figures are placed in the picture. They're placed in a triangular or pyramid structure so that the focus is on the most important figures, in this case, the child, held by his mother, who are in the center facing forward. This method of organizing his figures geometrically would become a trademark of da Vinci's, and it too would influence many of the great painters who succeeded him. 1495 was the next monumental year, for it was the year that da Vinci began working on the Last Supper. Ludovico wanted the mural for a monk's dining hall at a nearby monastery, it would be a wide mural. It had to include the thirteen disciples of Christ and Christ himself. The subject was their final meal. Da Vinci planned the mural by making a series of drawings. He would wander the streets of Milan, studying people's faces and expressions for inspiration. Before he began painting, he built a scaffold, and from there he would work, usually from early in the morning until sunset. Often he forgot to eat or drink. Other days he would study the wall, apply one or two brush strokes, and then leave. The making of the Last Supper was somewhat of a public event. People came to watch him as he worked, and da Vinci always welcomed them, often even inviting them to express an opinion of the work. 
The mural of the Last Supper took nearly three years to complete, and the world has been ever grateful that it was completed. Unlike many renowned works of art, it was famous from the moment it was unveiled. People then, as today, loved the drama of the picture, its amazingly lifelike figures with their individual expressions and gestures. Each character in the painting has his own character and personality. Da Vinci captured the imaginary responses of the disciples at the exact moment that Christ announced that one of them would betray him. For this reason, people take a particular interest in the expression on the face of Judas. Admirers of the Last Supper are often struck by the serene composure of Christ, sitting godlike amidst the stormy human emotions which surround him. Da Vinci broke with all tradition in the composition of his famous mural. He painted the disciples in small groups instead of the linear composition that typified previous art. The composition of the Last Supper is so powerful that it has influenced an endless number of artists who follow da Vinci, among them Rubens and Rembrandt. It also inspired Goethe to write some of his finest passages in description of the painting. It has been reproduced on countless prints and postcards and remains today as much a part of our culture as it was of the Renaissance. During World War II, the monastery where Leonardo had painted the Last Supper was destroyed by a bomb. Miraculously, the wall bearing the painting was spared, but there have been other problems. Leonardo was experimenting with fresco painting when he made the Last Supper. Unfortunately, his experimentation had disastrous results. He used a new technique that began to show signs of decay with only twenty years. It involved coating the wall with a compound that was supposed to hold the paint in place and protect it from moisture. Instead, the paint soon began to flake away. There have been many attempts to restore the painting, but not until after World War II was a technique applied that finally halted its decay. Today, it is considered a virtual ruin. About nine years after he finished The Last Supper, Leonardo created his other consummate masterpiece, The Mona Lisa. It's probably his most famous work, known mostly to the layperson, for the mysterious smile on his subject's face. Da Vinci showed his subject in a relaxed pose, hands crossed on her lap, before a background of mountain peaks. The hands were important. Before this portrait, artists always painted their subjects from the chest up. Leonardo's decision to include the lower body and hands gave portraits a more natural appearance, and his pose was imitated in many portraits by many other artists for years to come. In the Mona Lisa, Leonardo invented the painting technique called sfumato. Sfumato is an Italian word that means like smoke. It describes the way different areas of color and form are quietly merged together, like smoke dissolving into the air. This technique is largely responsible for the mysterious and subtle atmosphere in the painting. Leonardo kept the painting of the Mona Lisa himself until the King of France managed to acquire it for his personal collection. Today, it is in the Louvre in Paris. From 1510 to 1511, Leonardo painted St. Anne, Mary, and the Child, a work that more strongly demonstrates his use of sfumato, the misty, subtle merging of colors and tones that he introduced in the Mona Lisa. This painting is also notable for its vast, picturesque landscape in the background, a reflection of da Vinci's increasing interest in nature and geology. These key works are just a few examples of the enormous creative outflow that distinguished the life of Leonardo da Vinci. It was a life of immense vitality and of enormous vision. Perhaps what is most astonishing about da Vinci is the vast scope of his interest and achievements. Although he is remembered chiefly for his art, Leonardo da Vinci was far more than an artist. This became even more evident when several more of his notebooks were found in the mid-1900s. They reflected an understanding of science and engineering that was centuries ahead of its time. Today we have an advantage over his contemporaries, for we can recognize his extraordinary prescience, the airplanes, the helicopters, the parachutes, the submarines, and the bicycles he sketched all foreshadowed their invention. The versatility and originality of these notebooks and sketches was equaled in his paintings and other art. He painted the most famous portrait in the world, and perhaps the two most famous paintings, the Mona Lisa and the Last Supper. His work influenced and inspired the next generation of artists, and many generations to come. They have stood out in all periods of time and in all countries as true masterpieces. Yet perhaps what is greatest about Leonardo da Vinci is his unquenchable thirst for learning. 
for it is this thirst that most personifies the human spirit and the higher purpose of our being. For da Vinci, this learning occurred through what the eye could see. He was never interested in abstract principles like philosophy or history or religion. He believed sight was the most important sense, because it conveyed facts immediately and accurately. The theme of his learning was sapere vedere, knowing how to see. This keen observation combined with creative imagination created a new art form. He demanded truth, accuracy, and beauty in everything he depicted. Da Vinci took an integrated holistic approach to learning and knowledge. His fascination with art and science are part of the same lifelong pursuit of knowledge, and he synthesized his learning in both disciplines to perfect his skills in each. His spirit of inquiry, his unlimited desire for knowledge, and his ability to transfer the learning in one sphere to another is what made him one of the foremost minds in recorded history. Leonardo da Vinci will live on as the consummate Renaissance man.